You're listening to the Plastic Shift Podcast. Welcome to the Plastic Shift Podcast. I'm Madhav Malhotra, one of the students at the Plastic Shift, and I'm reaching out to several experts working to solve issues with plastic pollution. This podcast showcases unique perspectives on this massive problem to identify what its most important aspects are. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Paritosh Deshpande, a professor at the Department of Industrial Economics and Technology Management at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. His research studies several aspects of waste management in the fishing and shipping industries. I'm excited to hear his perspective on how these industries affect the overall plastic pollution problem. Thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this and I'm excited to learn more about the specifics of your research. And I thought we could uh, start off by talking about that. And I would love to ask you, could you quickly summarize the past work you've done and your research interests? So I I did my bachelor's in uh, chemical engineering from India and then I shifted to Sweden, Stockholm to do to pursue my master's in environmental engineering in, and sustainable infrastructure from KTH, uh, Royal Institute of Technology, Sweden. And then uh, I worked for six months uh, for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal Program. They wanted to create a baseline about uh, renewable energy for all and what are the uh, so to say background of how, how much energy is there in the world and how, how is it distributed over uh, over the surface area, for example, in the African continent or Indian continent or uh, Asian continent, for example. Uh, the energy electrification rates are a bit less as compared to the total energy so available. So I worked for that project for about six to eight months, and then I started my PhD uh, in Norway at NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. In my PhD, I specifically looked into the aspects of uh, marine plastic and marine plastic specifically coming from fishing gears because uh, Norway is uh, one of the major players when it comes to commercial fishing. Uh, If I were to generalize about Europe, then Norway holds 35% to 40% of total shares of only fishing stocks uh, that that are coming in the market. 35 to 40 percent of them are coming from Norway. So you can see how how big Norway, how big is the sector of this fishing, uh, how the, how big is this fishing sector in Norway, for example. Mm-hmm. So marine plastic in general is a transboundary problem because it's just like climate change. You know, you cannot throw a plastic in one ocean and then you 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 may also find it in another ocean because all the oceans are connected, fortunately or unfortunately. In this case, it's unfortunately because you pollute somewhere else and pollutant may reach somewhere else, uh, even in the pristine land such as Norway. Uh, so initially in 2015, there was not much of a focus was placed on marine plastic red problem because Norway is population wise, it's a small country and it's quite well maintained. Resources are very well preserved. At least the, I come from India. If I compare with India, then of course uh, the resources are very well protected in, in this part of the world. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, Plastic waste is a transboundary problem, especially when it comes to marine plastic. Then uh, one fine day in later part of 2015, uh, one whale was landed on the one of the western beaches of Norway and it fa- they found it dead, basically. Uh, and when they conducted the autopsy of why this big, huge animal or the biggest mammal alive is, uh, is lying on the beach like that, in its not uh, suitable habitat. They found around 17 uh, plastic bags in her stomach. That, uh, that, was, the top, that was the starting point, uh, basically. So the entire focus shifted to marine plastic in Norway in later part of 2015. So a- apart from this marine plastic, uh, one particular, particularly threatening faction comes from fishing sector because you cannot compare plastic bags in the ocean versus plastic fishing gear in the ocean. Fishing gears or fishing nets, basically, they are made up of three types of plastic polymers, polyethylene, polypropylene, and nylon. And all these three polymers have extensive durability and quite quite great tensile strength. That's why they are so popular uh, in the manufacturing of fishing gears. So I started studying, I started looking into what are the system life cycle of commercial fishing gears in Norway. 
considering fishing is the primary activity of Norway. And if you see fishing gears, if fishers lose them in, uh, in the ocean, or if they just abandon the fishing gears in the ocean, then one fish, that particular fishing gear, lost fishing gear, will continue to catch or kill uh, marine organism. That was th that th that is the intention why they built fishing gears in the first place. So fishing gears have way too much, uh, uh, way too bigger potential to destroy marine ecosystem than uh, one plastic bag or one plastic bottle. But we do not we in in the science. Uh, I mean to say. Mm -hmm. Science is not developed yet to calculate the impacts of abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing gears on the marine ecosystem as well as on the coastal ecosystem. So that was the starting point of my research, and from there I took it forward to uh, see how much of the plastic is entering in the ocean in the form of discarded, abandoned, or discarded fishing gears in Norway. Then uh, how much is getting collected uh, from the ocean uh, or from the beach cleanup activities. And then further, how once they once collected, how authorities, how, how waste management companies target this particular plastic? How, how do they handle it? How do they manage it? So I spent four years in extensively working on uh, these particular questions, and then uh, relevant answers were found out for Norway, and that can be of course generalized to other places as well. Yeah, that's uh, great to hear, and. I know you talked about all the uh, specifics of the industry for fishing in Norway and talked about some of the uh, more nitty gritty details of what's actually going down um, when you focus on the details there. But just to take a step back to look at the overall problem in Norway or in uh, another country in the world, how significant is plastic waste from the fishing industry when it comes to um, marine plastic pollution as a whole? Well, that's a very good question. I will start with uh, bottom up or let's say marine plastic in general. There is a uh, paper that came out in 2015, research paper uh, that was published in Science and uh, University of Georgia, Professor Jena Jembak uh, wrote that article saying, around 8 to 12 million metric tons of plastic is entering in the ocean every year from the land-based sources. So that question or, or that paper basically rose the eyebrows of the entire world and everyone started talking about marine plastic and how, how can we target, what can we do to target uh, marine plastic uh, waste. Then several articles came up regarding, uh, they were talking about how there is a great garbage patch happening in the uh, Pacific Ocean and how, how big is that and that is as big as some continents in the world almost. So all these were threatening studies and uh, they rose eyebrows about marine plastic. But down the side, one, uh, one basic, uh, all the studies missed one point that they couldn't, contrib they couldn't talk about how much plastic is coming from the fishing sector. Because fishing, the entire fishing activity happens in the ocean, more or less, all the commercial fishing, basically. But they couldn't put their finger on this exact uh, issue of how much plastic is ending up in the ocean from fishing sector. That was also mentioned in uh, the papers uh, that I mentioned earlier. So, of course, we know how much plastic is coming in the ocean from land-based sources. This is 8 to 12 million metric ton. but in Norway, from the beach cleanup activities, uh, when beach clean in Norway every year, there are several agencies that uh, that are responsible for cleaning the beaches. Uh, there, there is a lot of waste that is uh, landing up in the beaches of Norway. As as I mentioned earlier, plastic is a transboundary problem. Uh, so once they collect these litter items from the beach cleanup operations, they try to segregate it with respect to their sources, and some of the studies revealed that around 30 to 35 percent of the total collected beach litter fractions come from fishing sector. So the number may vary based on which country you are dealing with, as Norway is quite important player, uh, quite an important player when it comes to commercial fishing. So this number may go up to 35 to 40 percent uh, of total waste uh, on the beaches. But at the same time, in, in non-fishing countries that has coastal area, 
this number may come down to 25%, uh, but not less than that. So that is our primary estimate and that is the starting point uh, with which we move ahead. Yeah, that's great to hear. And obviously, um, marine plastic pollution and overall plastic waste are different, but this really does seem to be a key component of uh, marine plastic pollution. And to dive deeper into that, um, especially for most people learning about this issue for the first time, um, we often think of, well, you know, it's probably nets being lost from fishing vessels, or, and that's the uh, predominant cause of the problem, but most people wouldn't really know what the uh, details of the situation look like. I know you mentioned some of the polymers of plastic that are often found in fishing waste. Could you also talk about some of the common items that come from um, the fishing industry that are lost in the ocean and also how these items, I guess, are lost? Like what's going on on the ships that if it is nets being lost, what's going on that's making these uh, plastics be lost in the ocean? Perfect, that's a great question again, but it's a very complicated question uh, to start with. Uh, it's not as simple as uh, losing the fishing gear in the ocean. There are several reasons. Fishing itself, or you cannot, uh, I mean, fishing grounds are kind of marked. So Norway has their own fishing territory. So is Russia, so is uh, Canada, or so, so is any other country in the world. But uh, all these fishing countries also give away license to external countries. For example, uh, Spanish fishers have license to fish in Norway, Norwegian waters, and vice versa. And the quotas are fixed. So every uh, the licenses are given in terms of quotas. Like for example, uh, catching mackerel or catching cod or catching tor or shrimps. Uh, so every one particular country is allowed to fish around five tons equivalent of shrimps in Norwegian waters. And Norwegian fishers would get uh, two tons of two tons equivalent of torch uh, or which is cod in Spanish water. So I'm just giving this an, as an example. So that's how quotas are decide, decided uh, and they have been distributed. So the point I wanted to mention over here is in Norwegian waters, there are not only Norwegian fishers who are fishing, there are fishers from the other countries. They come and go uh, based on their quota sizes and every fishing uh, company fishing fleet itself is divided into two parts uh, one is a coastal going fishing vessels that are smaller fishing vessels that do not have bigger engine capacities to go into the deep water uh, to catch uh, bigger fish species or complicated fish species so they are only responsible for fishing in the coastal areas and they use various sorts of fishing gears for doing so so coastal fishers use less complicated fishing gears such as gill nets, uh, long lines, traps or pots to catch crabs and shrimps, for example. Uh, while the bigger fishing vessels such as ocean going fishing vessels that has more advanced machinery on board, uh, they have more advanced engine, they are usually bigger fishing vessels. Uh, they go deep in the water, deep in the ocean and they do sophisticated fishing uh, with respect to uh, sophisticated fishing gears have been deployed, such as trawls, gill net, uh, trawls or uh, auto lines or purse signs, Danish signs, for example. Uh, I'm telling you all these things because it is essential to know the background of how fishing activity happens. So for me, when I started my own work, uh, fishing gear means one small fishing net, and that's not it, basically. Fishing gear itself uh, has several other layers. Fishing net is just one part of it. There is another rope that is uh, that to which the entire fishing gear is tied up to. So if the fishing gear is complicated in the, for example, trawls or purse signs, they use chains or metal ropes or metal wires to hold the fishing gear. Then there are also floats that keep on floating on the water to hold the fishing net in the ocean. Uh, so there are several other accessories associated with the fishing gear. Uh, so the and the weight itself of fishing gear also varies a lot. So the cheapest or smallest gill net would weigh up to three to four kilos, whereas uh, the most complicated fishing gear, which is purse sign or Danish sign or trawl, they can weigh up to 
35,000 to 45,000, even 50,000 kilos. So the weight range is enormous uh, with respect to fishing gear. And all these fishing gears have different mechanisms and fishing gears, I mean, till, till the earlier early part of 19th or 20th century, fishers used to just dispose of fishing gears in the ocean. Once the fishing gear is, so to say, destroyed uh, in, in, during the operation, and if it is not repairable, then fishers just used to simply throw that in the water uh, because, of course, like everyone knows, ocean is the biggest landfill that we have on Earth. So you just throw it uh, down the fishing vessel and that's the easiest way. Nobody knows what's happened in the ocean. But basically what happens in the ocean remains in the ocean. So uh, th that was the practice uh, which was pretty common uh, till... I mean, it, it still happens in some part of the world, but of course, uh, even fishers are being educated now, and they they have they don't they know that if we don't protect this uh, uh, marine resources, then the resources won't be last uh, won't last for their future generations. So it won't be sustainable uh, to just throw fishing gears on over the board. So that was the first cause of uh, fishing gears ending up in the ocean, which is abandoning or which is very simplistic cause. So everyone blames fishers for doing this thing, but of course, it's a normal human tendency anyway. Uh, I will move on to the next part, which is gear failure. Gear means fishing gear failure. Once you deploy fishing gears, uh, there are uh, bad weather conditions or ocean topography is uh, sometimes not, uh, I mean, because not all the vessels have sonar or radar system, they cannot detect uh, the topography of ocean surface. So if it, if it has a if it has a rocky topography, then fishing gears may get stuck in some of the rocks, and then if you apply extra pressure, then fishing gears may break, and then that part of the fishing gear may end up in the ocean. So that is another common cause. Another thing is. Uh, so to say, navigational uh, losses. For example, ocean is not only for fishing. Ocean is basically for marine transport. A uh, lot of multinational companies or bigger shipping vessels, they ship goods from place A to place B through ocean territories. And when fishing gears are, so to say, deployed in the ocean, that are because some of the gears are passive gears. So fishers, what they do is they just deploy fishing gears in the ocean they, and they wait uh, for one or two weeks so that uh, fishes will come and uh, they get caught in the, uh, so to say, passive fishing gears. And then they will go back there again and they will retrieve the, that particular gear and whatever comes with that gear is their catch, basically. So in terms of passive gears that are there in the water, uh, sometimes these fishing gears, if they are not marked properly, the navigational or other maritime fish, uh, shipping it, ships that that go through ocean, they their propellers or their uh, they might come in their way basically, and then of course they, the gears will get destroyed. The gears get get gears do get destroyed due to such fishing vessels, uh, the shipping vessels. That is another cause, and uh, yeah, many times when fishing gears are deployed in the ocean, they are aimed to catch the entire shoal of fishes. For example, uh, cod or torsk. They these sort of fishes, they fishers capture them in entire shoal. So the entire colony of fishes being captured in one fishing gear. And if the fishes behave smart uh, and and they decide, if all of them decide at the same time to flow against uh, the fishing gear, then they can, with their force, break the fishing gear. So that, of course happens uh, the chances of this happening is very less but that that do ha that does happen sometimes so yes there are several such causes of uh, uh, fishing gears that are getting lost in the ocean also when we interviewed fishers they also point fingers at other uh, nations for example uh, from fishers from country a can blame country b that their fishers they come to our territory and they throw their fishing gears over here because uh, the handling charges of waste fishing gears to uh, some of the waste management companies in their country is too high. So they just wanted to dispose of their waste in our territories. And same thing applies 
uh, when we interview country B Fisher. So it's just a pointing finger game. But at the end, uh, ocean is at the loss. Basically, whoever throws the fishing gear, it's it's anyway contributing to the pollution. So yeah, there are several causes, and in not all the causes, fishing uh, fishers are responsible. That's what I meant to say. They are just one part of the problem, but they are not the only problem. Yeah, for sure. And it definitely seems like it's a really complicated issue from all these different causes. So what do you think are some promising approaches currently being deployed or studied that can address this? And how likely are these approaches to be able to scale from, say, just like one fishing country to the rest of the world? So basically, my background is environmental resource management. And when in the resource management studies, we work with the basic principle is that if you can't manage it, you cannot protect it. So uh, if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it, basically. So I did, uh, I did study the life cycle of fishing gears. How do they behave or how often, uh, what happens with fishing gears right from their production to use to once they get lost or once they get into the waste management companies. So I will stick to my research and I will try to communicate uh, several strategies mentioned by you uh, on managing waste fishing gears or fishing gears in general. So basically, a typical life cycle of any product is product is being designed and then, so to say, produced. And then, of course, fishers purchase those fishing gears. And then in the uh, then begins the use phase of that product or uh, how the how that product is being used. So the second phase is use phase. So in the use phase, fishers deploy those fishing gears, and then after every deployment, fishing gears uh, are exposed to some sorts of wear and tear. So that wear and tear, uh, fishers are basically quite frugal in that sense. They try to uh, repair every single fishing gear till the point that it is not repairable any further. So there are several uh, smaller or bigger scale repairs going on after every deployment of fishing gear. We, irrespective of the category of fishing gear, whether, whether it is a gill net or it's a trawl. So repairs do happen non-stop throughout their use phase. In the repair, uh, after the repair, once uh, if fishing gears are not lost in the ocean already, then Fishing gear, fishers continuously repair those fishing gears till the point that they are not repairable any further. And then they will just dispose of that fishing gear to the nearest waste management company or, for example, some ports where uh, there are port reception facilities or, in other words, just a dustbin uh, where they dispose of their fishing gears. And then waste management companies will come and treat the fishing gears uh, with respect to their condition, whether to landfill it or to incinerate it to recover energy or to recycle it for further reuse. So that that is, in short, a system life cycle of fishing gears. And now I will come to the main question, which is what are the strategies or what are the ways to manage these fishing gears? So first, which is the design or pre-use phase, design and production or design and supply. So of course, fishing gears today are uh, not marked. So that there are no, so to say, gear markings to the fishing gears. So Food and Agricultural Authority of the United Nations is trying to look into this problem. Many scientists are also looking into this problem that how can we identify fishing gears once they get lost? Or can we track fishing gears? Can we put, so to say, uh, a chip or something like that on the gears uh, once we deploy them? Then perhaps we can retrieve them once they get lost upon deployment. So such sorts of gear identification marking or tagging of fishing gear sort of technologies are being uh, studied all throughout everywhere perhaps. But the problem with that is you cannot receive signals from, you cannot receive signal after a particular, uh, after the fishing gear is reaches some depth in the ocean. It's impossible to track that fishing gear because most of the ocean, deep water ocean fishing gears are quite uh, they, they do a lot of deep water fishing and you cannot receive geos, uh, GI signals or any sorts of uh, satellite signals from that uh, tags. We do not have such advanced tags yet. 
and if we ever develop such tax then the viability economic viability of such solution will always remain a challenge because fishers are not uh, they are not economically very well equipped in uh, everywhere basically maybe in norway some fishers are quite economically stable but that's not the case all over the world so i i highly doubt the global reach of this solution although this this is a fascinating idea to tag fishing gears or mark fishing gears mm -hmm. so currently another aspect that is being studied is barcoding fishing gears or at least making the uh, at least tagging them uh, with something so that once fishers abandon fishing gears in the ocean or they if they dispose of their fishing gears in the ocean then if some other fishers or if some other companies if they retrieve such fishing gears then they can at least know from the tag that whose whose gear is this who is this belonging to then you can take the responsibility so so basically this is for the accountability purpose so if you include this uh, solution in the picture if uh, then at least fishers will have some sort of check when they throw fishing gears they will be they know that if this fishing gear is being caught by someone else then yeah we we will have to be accountable for uh, this situation so this is kind of easily implementable solution and effectivity will of course we we will discuss the, i mean the effectivity of the solution remains it's a topic of debate another topic of debate but at least it it could be a, a solution to start with then another uh, another strategy could be extended producer responsibility where where uh, it's a strategy where fishing gear manufacturers bear the end of life treatment cost of fishing gears for example the producers who are producing the fishing gears will carry the responsibility of managing uh, the old fishing gears uh, once they reach their end of life so in effect uh, this removes the inconvenience and cost factors associated with the waste management from fishers so if fishers were to if fishers were to uh, say that okay you if your fishing gear is abandoned or it's not working in working condition anymore it is just just dispose of, dispose it off to uh, nearest fishing gear manufacturer and then they will take the responsibility of that and then you can get the new fishing gear for less price or let's say it's a 25% off for you if you want to buy a new fishing gear uh once you handed handed in your previous fishing gear so that is also one of one of the thing which is which is also basically nothing but a take back scheme so it's a part of uh, extended producer responsibility when where the collection of collection of products after end of life uh, is the responsibility of uh, producers itself that could be done another thing is environmental service tax so when you sell a product in the, in this case a fishing gear then you charge for example the product product is x uh, if if it is costing for example 100 usd then charge it 105 usd in the first place so the 5 5 usd or 5 dollars will go to creating uh, more mature waste management networks or more mature collection facilities for fishing uh, old fishing gears so that could be so money for that uh waste management could be taken in the form of service tax when you sell the product in the first place it has been tried in many other products uh, around the globe for example electronic products or uh, even uh, yeah i mean there are many such products mobiles or laptops they have such environmental service tax included in many countries so this could be replicated over here as well so these these are some of the designed or pre used phase solutions another exciting solution could be to make fishing gears that are biodegradable or that are made of made with biodegradable plastics or plastics that can uh, deform quickly once they are lost in the ocean so that there will be less threat to marine ecology or marine organism this is being researched in norway extensively or also in other eu countries quite extensively but the downside of uh, biodegradable plastic is it can degrade it can get degraded but it will get degraded into formation of microplastic so we still don't know the entire problem that is associated with the macro fractions and i mean we shouldn't investigate into the solution that 
that may sound promising today, but then we, we will be creating monsters of microplastic for tomorrow. So the sustainability of uh, this biodegradable plastic solution is always under debate and that will remain so until uh, researchers working on, on those fields would uh, come up with some solid answers to the argument to that problem. So yes, that those are some of my thoughts about the uh, production phase. Then, then, then comes to use phase. Like once fishing gears are being sold to the fishers, how can we minimize the leakage of fishing gears through their use phase? Uh, so of course, some of the themes could be uh, one of the strategies penalty schemes. So fishing vessels that do not discharge waste fishing gears on the ports or uh, they will be financially penalized uh, under the penalty schemes. In that scheme, I mean, of course, it's like a check and uh, check ma check balance basically on the fishing vessels. If you are taking, for example, 50 fishing gears with you in this fishing trip, then you should come back and have 50 fishing gears. If not, then you have to show where you have disposed of your fishing gears in which port, for example. Or if it is lost, then where you have exactly lost it? What are the coordinates? So if you could provide the coordinates, then at least clean up ocean cleanup agencies could go and try to retrieve that fishing gears with their advanced equipments. So if there are penalty schemes in place uh, for fishing vessels, then fishers would behave more responsibly uh, and try to, uh, so to say, minimize the leakage of fishing gears through abandoning part at least. You cannot control once you, if your fishing gear is getting lost due to bad weather or other factors that I mentioned earlier, but at least you can minimize the loss from irresponsible behavior in the first place. Another way to do it is uh, educating newer generation of fishers. So as uh, fishing itself is a quite, uh, so to say, it comes from the generation. It, it has a lot of hidden knowledge uh, from the, uh, so, so the previous generation has a lot of hidden knowledge about how to responsibly manage their fishing gears over the period of uh, time. So the knowledge from more mature or more, uh, so to say, experienced fishers should, should get transferred to the next generation or to the new, uh, to the young generation that is interested in uh, coming into fishing sector as uh, as a profession as their pro profession so they should know about what are the loopholes in uh, handling fishing gears for example so this is called as fishers knowledge or fishers ecological knowledge and this this science of fishers knowledge should get transferred to the new generation uh, through so to say harmonized workshops or uh, it should be in their syllabus somewhere so this would also uh, reduce the leakage that are happening to ir uh, irresponsible fishing. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, yeah, the next solution could be, uh, of course, there are several ocean and beach cleanup operations that are happening all across the world. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, in Norway, uh, the Directorate of Fisher Fisheries in Norway, they conduct annual cleanup operations in the ocean. So they start from the west, uh, so southmost part of Norway, and the, vessel, the fishing vessel with advanced equipments, with advanced radar and sonar on board, they are designed to capture lost fishing gears or other sorts of marine litter, uh, which could be harmful for no Norwegian fishery, fishery sector, for example. So they try to retrieve those fishing gears uh, in one month to 45 days long operation, in which that vessel starts from southernmost part and goes all the way up north to collect fishing gears uh, that are there in the ocean. So now Norway annually collects around 50 to 60 tons of fishing, uh, fishing gears, lost fishing gears through this attempt, through this ocean cleanup attempt uh, conducted by Norwegian Directorate of Fisheries. Similarly, around uh, the lighter fractions of fishing gears that, that can float on the water, the lost, lighter fractions of lost fishing gears, they end up on the beaches once they, uh, once they are lost. So in general, the studies show that around 60% of the fraction of fishing gears is lighter fraction, and they once they are cut off from the heavier fractions, then the 60% fraction will come up, uh, will try, will keep on floating in the on the ocean waves, and then eventually end up on the nearest coast. So 
that's why we found around 30 to 35 percent of uh, the beach litter coming from fishing gears or fishing sector itself so beach cleanup operations is also one of the major sources to manage abandoned lost or discarded fishing gears but in norway in my study i found out that in total around 80 to 90 tons of plastic uh, fishing gears are getting collected through both ocean and beach cleanup operations combined through one year. Uh, whereas fishing practices of Norway uh, loses around 400 tons equivalent fishing gears every year uh, in the form of abandoned, discarded or lost fishing gears. So if you do the balance, then around out of 400 tons, 100 tons are getting retrieved from ocean or beach cleanup uh, operations whereas 300 tons are still lying in the ocean every year from Norway alone so so this could be a solution but this is not the only solution because it is not even solving one fourth of the problem that's mm -hmm. what I meant to say. Uh, another way to do it is port reception facilities which is a sweeter, word, sweeter name for dustbins basically so every port according to European Union every port uh, who is uh, every port on the in the states should have harmonized port reception facilities where fishing vessels could dispose of their waste fishing gears uh, at, at a very minimal fees. So if you have basically, so the logic behind this is if you have port reception facilities, then people could have the opportunity to dispose of waste fishing gears when they are on that port. Uh, in, in case of uh, there are no reception facilities, no such reception facilities, then fishers would, of course, have no place to throw off their, dispose of their waste fishing gears. So that's why in 2018, European Union has mandated all the states uh, across Europe must have this port reception facility in place as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Norway is way behind uh, in this particular race as only one fourth of total ports in Norway have harmonized port reception facility. Well, the reason behind this in, uh, is that in Norway, there are more than 5,000 ports uh, as compared to other European members who has 18 or 20 or five or six. So you just cannot compare uh, because Norway geography is such that you can have, Norway has, Norway is blessed with enormous or gigantic, uh, so to say, uh, coastal area because of the geography so that's why we have so many ports over here that do not have uh, port reception facility and it is practically impossible to have port reception facility on every single port uh, but again this could be one of the solutions again then yeah reward schemes could be another solution for fishers uh, if they dispose of some of the fishing gears once they for example if fishing gears if the fishers are fishing in the ocean and if they stumble upon unmanaged or lost fishing gears when they fish when they were fishing then they can take that fishing gear and if they so to say uh, deliver that fishing gears to the nearest port uh, in the port reception facility or somewhere else then they should get rewarded for such a delivery today that's not the case so that's why fishing fishers uh, even if they find discarded fishing gear or for example discarded tire or whatever it is they just again throw it off in the ocean because the vessels are usually small and if they wanted to deliver that waste in the nearest port then they will be charged to dispose of the waste that they found during fishing because then uh, today's law considers that uh, waste as the waste generated by that fishing company uh, not some waste that they found some from somewhere else. So they cannot do, so to say, the voluntary service today because that service is costing them uh, if they want to deliver the, the waste that they found during fishing operation. So such reward schemes could help, uh, you know, take the solution to next level. Well, mm -hmm. these are some strategies from, again, uh, yeah, from the use phase. And then I will come to the last bit of this problem, which is closing the loop of plastics or it is the end of life. Uh, what are the end of life strategies for uh, how can we improve collection or how can we improve uh, sustainable management of waste fishing gears once they are delivered to the waste management facilities. 
so yes of course like fishing gears uh, as i mentioned earlier they are made up of three polymers polyethylene polypropylene and nylon and recycling for those polymers is easily possible not easily possible it is but it is not impossible as well many recyclers are trying to develop various solutions out of uh, how can we recycle uh, these particular three polymers and uh, repurpose it to something else so currently mechanical recycling of waste fishing gear related plastic is possible and then you re recover hdp and ldp which is high density polyethylene and high low density polypropylene or polyethylene this can be directly used in any of the injection molding products or any of the plastic products that are uh, made through injection molding process so uh, that includes chairs or buckets or uh, yeah i mean what not so this sorts of industrial symbiosis could happen like plastic from one sector can the waste from one sector can be used as a resource in another sector but such sorts of industrial synergies should be we should have we should explore it, it a bit more further currently in norway all the recyclable fraction is sent abroad for recycling so even if around 50 to 60% of the fraction is sent for recycling norway claims that this is a recycling but uh, as long as it is not happening on the norwegian territory uh, i have some apprehension in considering that as recycling it's just transporting for recycling so you the country has no control over what happens to that uh, fraction which they send it for recycling purpose whether it is recycling or not it's uh, so the accountability is very less uh, that's what i meant to say so this could be improved mm -hmm. and also fishing gears are currently quite complicated uh, in terms of designing they are designed designed to last long they are designed to be durable be, be, be more flexible have more strength and strength uh, all the properties that make them best fishing gears that are out there for commercial fishers but the producers of fishing gears have not looked into one of the major aspect is that fishing gears currently are not designed for recycling so if a fishing if a, if a recycler wanted to recycle waste fishing gear then he has to first segregate the metal parts out of it then have to seg segregate polyethylene polypropylene and nylon fraction uh, i mean there is no homogeneity in any sorts of uh, material that uh, producers are currently using for manufacturing fishing gears so if you make them for uh, suitable for recyclers uh, so to say design fishing gears in such a way that it it should be easier for them to you know structurally de deconstruct it and recycle it easily so fishing gear recyclers are spending lot of money in so to say trying to form a system of segregating the recyclable fraction from the non recyclable fraction and that is causing them a lot of economic burden that's why recycling is not sustainable in today's world sustainable i mean to say economically sustainable so uh, the opportunities are there but uh, of course we need lot of solutions from here and there and there is no one size fit all solution you cannot have one solution uh that can solve the entire problem it's a complicated problem it has various elements right from the use phase to right from the production phase use phase and as well as end of life phase but there are very many opportunities at each and every phase that's what i identified through my work i am not the only one working in this sector there are many researchers have done enormous studies and very significant contributions in this particular sector regarding how to minimize the leakage and how to maximize uh, recyclability recyclability and uh, yeah how how to conserve resources as well as how to lessen the burden on marine ecosystem in the first place from the problem of fishing gear yeah and i really appreciate all the detail you went into cuz usually i have a bunch of questions about um, the barriers to overcome with each solution or the roles of different stakeholders in each solution but you provided a lot of those details and initially um from a perspective that external to this that hasn't um done the digging through all of the specific details it does seem like uh although one pro one solution might not work for solving 100% of the problem there are some solutions that 
could be more effective than others. For instance, focusing on the source of the fishing gears ending up in the ocean in the first place versus cleaning them up on beaches after they end up there. It seems like some of them are more effective than others. So the last thing I'd love to ask you is when it comes to your unique perspective on this, what, specifically for the um, problem with fishing gears, what are the most promising areas of work to be done here? And then with plastic pollution in general, marine plastic pollution in general, what are the most effective areas to be working on? Yes, uh, that's a good question again. Uh, of course, there are some solutions that are better than others. And as I mentioned earlier, prevention is always better than cure. So preventive management should be the way to go because once you dispose of fishing gears uh, or once the fishing gears are getting lost in the ocean, then of course, as I mentioned earlier, even with the extra extreme uh, reco recovery or retrieval operations through, uh, in, through the ocean cleanup operations or beach cleanup operations, you cannot go beyond one fourth, uh, solving one fourth of the problem. So that means we need to prevent it in the first place. Of course, I do not mean to intend that uh, we shouldn't conduct these ocean or beach cleanup operations, but we shouldn't depend on them. They cannot be the whole solution. So the solution could be, again, recycling. I will come back to the end-of-life treatment. Currently, the entire philosophy behind the word waste is quite problematic. If you consider a particular product as a waste, then you totally lose the meaning of utilizing that product in or looking at it in a different perspective currently that is what happening with waste plastic or waste fishing gear uh plastic in general if you could create economically viable and sustainable solutions to recycle that plastic uh, as i mentioned earlier if you could manage if if we could move further uh in the production phase itself and design fishing gears that are easy to recycle then perhaps we could have something which is which is a bit more sustainable in the first place because those fishing gears just for example fishing gears today once once fishers they dispose of their fishing gears in the waste management facilities the bigger fishing gears they are coming up with lot of fish oil or rotten biomass in it or lot of mud or so to say all these things so basically when they land up in the waste management facilities waste manager have no idea how to segregate that waste. The basic segregation of waste management is if the waste has a lot of biomass, you just put it in the uh, food waste category or just incinerate it. So then if the manager is segregating the waste fishing gear into food waste related fishing, uh, food, food related waste, then you are totally burning off the resources that, for example, plastic is getting burned. Uh, because you cannot segregate biomass from rotten biomass from the discarded fishing gears. So we need to create a manual for waste managers as well regarding how to how to manage when they get waste fishing gears. How do they segregate or uh, how can they be at help? What are the processes that we need to involve? Or is there a pre-cleaning possible in such place? Or is there a possibility to segregate metal fractions from fishing gears and plastic fractions from fishing gears, then we can recycle both metal as well as plastic because metal is of course recyclable. Uh, so yes, uh, and again, at the same time, as I mentioned earlier as well, that recycling where it happens is also quite important. For example, if a con country A is sending out all their fractions, uh, they are very good at collecting waste but they are sending away all the waste to uh, all the waste plastic to some other country for recycling then you are unnecessarily adding up on transport costs or emissions from transportation of that waste to country b and recycling it there instead of uh, recycling it in their own territory it is easily possible to create eco industrial networks for example in norway waste from fishing can uh, be directly fed into aquaculture sector there is a new term called a circular business models. Uh, this could be one of the most promising areas where we are currently investigating. Uh, the basic idea behind this is Norway is also a 
world leader or at least eu leader when it comes to fish farming and i don't know if you are aware of this term called as fish farming or aquaculture uh, where fishing where where salmon or other little shrimps for example they are uh, they are grown or cultivated in a big cage uh, in the ocean uh, in a big pool where which is surrounded with uh, the cage is made up of uh, well hdp and ldp or that sort of plastic polymers and then there are walkways and packets that are uh, that are some parts of this uh, aquaculture cage that can be made up of so to say virgin polyethylene and polypropylene so if we could replace the, there are studies or there are uh, industrial experiments going on on if they what would happen if the manufacturers of walkways and packets of aquaculture fish farms replace virgin raw material uh, which is virgin plastic polyethylene and polypropylene polymers with recycled hdp and ldp from waste fishing gear what would happen if they replace this and they are getting quite promising results in this uh, context so this can also lead to for example waste from one sector waste from fishing sector could lead to uh, could could become a become a resource for another sector which is uh, plastic industries producing fish farms or fish cages so this is sort of eco industrial network or industrial symbiosis uh, at it, at its best and then if we could achieve to do so then this is even more relevant in today's problem which is uh, due to the covid pandemic or due to the current situation the supply chains all across the world is totally uh, at standstill for example right now so norway who is respons- uh, who is totally dependent on asian market to receive virgin plastic polymers is currently suffering a huge setback when it comes to uh, the delivery of uh, virgin polymers because they are not getting any right now uh, and currently they are sending away uh, the available 4000 tons of uh, waste plastic from fishing gears to another country for recycling purpose so basically you are just ignoring 4000 tons of plastic that is available on your territory uh, and just sending it somewhere else if we if uh, a country like norway could establish new networks or new ideas about recycling this 4000 tons fraction within norway then they have at least solved some problems so they will at least minimize their over reliance on uh, other markets for receiving plastic virgin raw materials so such sorts of regional circular economy solutions regional circular business models or regional eco industrial networks could be the future of solving uh, this big problem of plastic pollution be it from be it comes whether it comes from fishing gears or any other types of marine plastic i guess it's it should follow the same logic if we could fix our problem in our own territory then every country would need to follow such approaches to tackle such transboundary problems yeah that seems uh, really interesting and especially with the details with how a lot of industries are facing pressure to change right now due to quarantines due to decreased oil prices due to uh, issues in the shipping industry uh, i really appreciate all the insight from how over the course of this problem there's definitely been some progression and especially right now we're seeing a lot of promising changes and in general this has been a really insightful conversation with all the details um we went into in covering what the uh, types of fishing gears that end up in the ocean are what the reasons for that are what the types of solutions are and how we might expect that to change in the future and lastly i i just wanted to ask um where can people learn more about uh this issue of fishing gears in the ocean or your work in particular yes uh, i usually i mean all my work is published online in ntnu we have uh, or in our university we have the policy to make our findings or our research open access so that the larger or broader audience could get benefited from the research or the work that we are doing so everything is available open access so if you just type discarded fishing gears or lost fishing gears on the google scholar or google you will find out uh, 
some of the articles that are coming from our research group or also some relevant articles coming from somewhere else uh, because a lot of people are working on this uh, problem right now and this problem is getting more and more attention uh, when united nations uh, fao fisheries and Agri agriculture organization is also putting a lot of efforts in researching into uh, this problem so just type it on google or if, even if you just type my name on google scholar all my publications as well as my phd thesis will come out google and then it, it can be easily downloadable or uh, shareable as well yeah. it's all open access yeah that's great to hear and thank you for making time to share all these insights um it was very valuable to hear the specifics of this industry that is happily now getting more attention thank you so much it was my pleasure as well